So welcome to this uh, interesting panel on breeding grounds for uh, unicorns. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel today um, with uh, experts in different areas from uh, investing uh, law to all aspects related to, to startup companies and uh, how to be successful. Uh, the session today will be like in three parts. In the first part, the speakers will introduce themselves and give a brief uh, perspective on, on the topic. Um, then we will talk about uh, several aspects of uh, unicorns. So first of all, what, what are the characteristics of a unicorn? How can you recognize it uh, early on? Um, then secondly, we will talk about uh, breeding grounds uh, for unicorns. So what's the ecosystem that can support a unicorn? Uh, after that, we will talk a bit about the regional perspective. Do we see any differences between unicorns, for instance, in China or Europe or, or USA? Um, and after that, we will talk about uh, some related topics like um, uh, what is the impact of COVID, for instance, or the current financial crisis on, on uh, unicorns and how do we see the evolution in the future? And uh, finally, we will talk about how uh, unicorns impact their environment. Uh, so the reverse uh, view actually, uh, for instance, on, on uh, employment. Um, so this is uh, our discussion, uh, certainly very uh, fascinating topics, but now I will let uh, the panel introduce uh, themselves. Um, maybe Jane, you, if you could start, start introducing yourself and, and give a brief note on, on unicorns in general. Sure. Thank you so much, Eve. And, and thank you, um, Horatius Events, for inviting me to speak today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Jane Chan, and I head up the Star Me Up HK team at Invest Hong Kong. Now, Invest Hong Kong is a government department helping overseas companies to establish and set up here in the city. And um, we have you know, nine different sector teams here in the head office to actually give some real industry specific support and advice. And we also have about 30 offices around the world as well to, to give local kind of cultures and, and countries and locations, um, you know, on the ground support. Um, so on the startup side, I've been with Invest Hong Kong heading up the startup division um, for nearly eight years now since it's been established. And we have um, three major objectives um, with our team. The first and foremost, of course, is actually helping the startups themselves and other kind of stakeholders of the startup ecosystem, such as investors, such as the accelerators, the, the corporate innovation labs, to actually get established here and also connect them to different kind of clusters and, and give them help them with PR, registering companies, all of that. So that's first and foremost our, our main function. But the two other hats that our team wears is also to promote Hong Kong internationally as a tech hub. Um, so, you know, Prior to all these um, the, the COVID restrictions, um, you know, we used to travel to quite a lot of different places. We talk about the different opportunities for startups um, in Hong Kong and through Hong Kong to mainland China as well as um, the greater Asia as well. And then the third thing that we do is... Um, also to, to build the ecosystem, what we say building, and obviously we are just one cog within this, this whole, um, you know, startup ecosystem with different functional areas. But I, I think the government does have a role to play um, in that. And, you know, I'll drill into that a little bit deeper um, further on. But suffice to say, um, with regards to the startup ecosystem and unicorns, um, we've been tracking the development of this. We've been doing a survey, a research survey. We have a research that vision in, in the Hong Kong office that's been tracking to see how the startup okay. has been developing. And um, at, to this date, we have nine unicorns in Hong Kong. Um, we've we've had two exits last year. We had two companies go, um, actually one go um, listed last year and one just listed yesterday, even though I found out about it last year and therefore, you know, keep assuming it's, it's that. So we've had two companies, one um, listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and one on NASDAQ. And, um, you know, in terms of the, the startup kind of sector that seemed to be very conducive to the unicorn creation, for us here in Hong Kong, it's very much on the fintech side of things. We we do have, um, you know, yeah. more fintechs who are unicorns. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'm sure yeah. I'll get you. Let's to talk about the uh, uh, details a bit later then. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for your introduction and, and your contribution. 
Uh, next, uh, Daniel, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So um, really great to share this panel with you today. So, um, so I'm the founder and managing part of Convergence Partners. We are a, a Zurich headquartered a venture capital firm, with a very strong um, international scope. So we also have offices in Germany, US, and actually also Hong Kong, which we uh, just opened a few months ago. And we are uh, basically investing in European health tech companies, so digital health and med tech, and very actively um, helping their internationalization to these large um, homogeneous uh, healthcare markets, you know, such as US, such as China, because our thesis is uh, in order to really scale a company and take towards, you know, unicorn potential, you really need to address uh, large markets early on. So it's basically uh, in our DNA to, to really rapidly accelerate the growth of these uh, companies. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm you know very glad to you know talk uh, about this today on this panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sebastian? Yeah, great pleasure um, to be here. Sebastian Schaefer, my name. Um, I'm a behavioral economist by training um, since uh, 10, 15 years in the startup industry, since uh, five, six years um, at Tech Quartier, um, co founder and managing director. And TQ is uh, an innovation agency, uh, if you wish, uh, an ecosystem builder. And we try to really focus on emerging trends and help corporates and startups you know, um, to um, understand and exploit them uh, in a collaborative manner. Headquartered in Frankfurt. Okay, thank you. Uh, a bit about myself. I'm a co-founder and CEO of a Swiss biotech company. Uh, we, we have a drug delivery platform which allows for uh, so-called biological medicines, um, which normally have to be injected to be taken as a pill. Uh, so a company is called Biolinguist, Biologics, sublingual under the tongue. And we have applications, for instance, in, in diabetes. Uh, many people have to take, for instance, insulin as an injection daily. Uh, we, we can develop a pill from it. Uh, but we're also working with a partner, for instance, on the uh, vaccine for COVID that can be taken sublingually. So, so that, for instance, you don't have to take the uh, uh, injections uh, anymore also for COVID. Um, uh, with that, uh, I suggest we start. So uh, as the topic is about uh, unicorns, uh, the first thing is to look, what, what is a unicorn? How can we characterize it? And, and this is a uh, unicorn is mainly like an investor uh, definition. So maybe I can ask uh, Daniel to give you your first perspective. What is a unicorn in your perspective as, a, as an investor? Well, I think there's a very clear definition of unicorn, right? So a company, a privately held company that reaches a evaluation of um, you know, 1 billion US dollars, right? I think that's the, you know, the, the general uh, definition. So it's really companies that um, have reached, uh, yeah, um, a certain uh, critical mass um, and um, that have moved uh, from, you know, startup to, um, you know, I would say enterprise stage. And um, yeah, I think we can talk about the features, um, you know, in a minute, but, you know, that's generally the, you know, definition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, well uh, let, let's talk a bit about the features then, because that that's what makes it interesting, of course. Uh, maybe, Sebastian, can you uh, talk a bit about how, how you see the features? Because you're also, let's say, uh, lecturing about startup companies and so on. So you have studied them very much in, in detail, I guess. Yeah, but perhaps uh, one um, one more point. I think um, when we talk about unicorns, and, and that's really a, a child of uh, the last decade, um, we, we also see there's a lot of hype. You know? And uh, I mean, if you look at the number of unicorns that emerged, in particular over the last two years, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's, um, um, it's almost unbelievable you know, that uh, the overall number uh, um, increased to roughly 1,000 um, unicorns and, and perhaps half of them emerged over the last two years. So, and of course, yeah, this is... Uh, um, related to the fact uh, that money has been very, very cheap. You know? And I think unicorns are very good because they help the startup industry to become more popular. Uh, um, today, also, the kids are talking about entrepreneurs. I think that's a very positive um, development. But you know, I think uh, we still have to see that these unicorns also develop into sustainable business models. You know? Only you know, having a valuation of $1 billion will not be enough uh, to have... Uh, yeah, a sustainable business that needs to be proven. Yeah? And given the current circumstances, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, hoping yeah, for the best yeah, that uh, we don't lose too many unicorns over the next uh, couple mm -hmm. of months and years. So that may be as a, yeah. uh, uh, as a disclaimer or uh, yeah. uh, as a caveat on, on the whole unicorn discussion. Yeah? We have to put it into context. Yes, of course. Uh, but, but what about, let's say, the characteristics of a, of a unicorn, aside from the fact that it's like a $1 billion uh, startup company? Um, can you expand a bit uh, on, on that further from, from your, let's say, studies that you have done? I mean, there are, <clears throat> there are um, like, like two dimensions that are interesting. The one is what, um, what makes, yeah, um, or what are the, the characteristics? And that is for sure yeah, a scalable business model. Yeah, one that addresses normally a big market, yeah, and and uh, that is that is what is also reflected in some of the uh, terms that were coined in recent years, like blitz scaling or or others, where where you know you grow at all cost. Yeah? That is that is something that is very important to understand. That's why you reach uh, these kind of evaluations when you look at like what kind of factors or what kind of uh, characteristics. Yeah, are more um, favorable yeah, for starting or creating a unicorn. There have been a couple of studies and, and one has looked at, uh, I don't know, 30,000 data points over the last uh, couple of uh, years, yeah, mostly um, through crunch-based data. And what they found is that yeah, um, if young teams are or consist of experienced entrepreneurs, those who already exited a company before, yeah, um, show uh, a higher likelihood uh, in a way of um, founding a unicorn. Yeah? So team and entrepreneurial experiences in the sense of successful access in the past yeah, um, seem to correlate very much with um, the unicorn um, like birth. Yeah? That, is, that is one of the um, observations. I think many of you would agree that the team is super important mm -hmm. um, for yeah. Uh, um, yeah. for that. Um, Jane, anything, any other characteristics you see on, 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 on unicorns? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the previous points that Sebastian raised about taking the context of, of the caveat, you know, the cheap money is true. I, I think we do need to, to take that into account. But I think we also need to have a kind of, I suppose, a metric on how to measure the success of, you know, as a, a startup ecosystem or um, the success of one company versus yet another tech startup. And, and, you know, there are many metrics that can be used, but I think that is, you know, one that people can relate to, even if that price maybe is, is artificially high at this moment in time. But that aside, I mean, I, I do completely agree with, um, you know, the points with unicorns where you have to have a good team, the scalability, the growth mindset, incredibly important. But, and, and of course, the chances of having uh, a success when you are a serial mm -hmm. entrepreneur I think it's, it's you know it's been demonstrated across a number of different areas as well but I think the one thing that that is quite interesting also is also I find that the unicorn maybe is, is really a, a zeitgeist of that moment with the opportunities that are happening you know at that specific time um, so for example a good example for us here in Hong Kong may be Anamoka Anamoka has become, um, it, it became a unicorn relatively recently last year. It's a blockchain gaming company. And, um, you know, that's moved into the metaverse, the web 3.0 mm. side of things. Now, you know, there were all these different kind of activities happening with gaming before. But I think that whole kind of like um, um, coalescence of, you know, the, the blockchain opportunities that tap in, into the, the fintech, the payment side of things. And then suddenly when people can actually own the different assets you know and trade that across different gaming platforms and not just be completely um enclosed into one specific game i think these kind of things really are you know something that developed in that specific time and that provides an opportunities for companies that can you know basically maximize that and and i think that is also um something we've we've got to to take into account as well is is that you know how things have developed in that time and a solution that's risen to to address that okay. yeah great yeah and, and daniel um aside from let's say the uh the the big market uh, potential that the, the let's say excellent team and founder and let's say that zeitgeist or or um, what, what what other factors do you see that characterize, let's say, a, 
a, a unicorn or potential unicorn. So I think um, uh, in addition to that, clearly the location, right, where you set up your your, your shop. Um, so if you look at a thousand unicorns, um, it's probably you know, 600 in the US right now, uh, around 300, close to 300 in China, right? So these are markets that are, you know, flush with cash, right? Um, in the US, you have uh, VCs, you know, that have raised a humongous amounts of money over the last years that they need to deploy. In China, you have capital controls. It's difficult to get your you know, money out of the country. So there's a lot of cash actually sitting in China, um, you know, and uh, in addition to real estate and the, the stock markets, you know, private markets is the only way this cash can go into, right? So, so really availability of cash, you know, location uh, is very clearly a, a factor. And, um, and then linked to what Sebastian said, really these, you know, large markets, I mean, um, again, in the US and China, are significant, right? That's also what we're, we're trying to play. So if you again look at the thousand unicorns, most of them are, you know, sitting um, in either uh, fintech, um, you know, direct to consumer, e-commerce, uh, internet uh, services and software. You know, these are all, uh, these are key sectors. You're, you're not really seeing that many unicorns in hardware, for example, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think uh, these are maybe some other um, points. Yeah, yeah maybe. Um, okay. Maybe I can share some uh, um, some insights from Germany. I guess Daniel, you know Germany also quite well. Um, but um, here you here you can really see that um, Germany um, needed a while to adopt this growth mindset. Now we we tend to think uh, in national borders and national mm -hmm. markets, and that that doesn't fit yeah, with uh, the VC perspective and the unicorn perspective, right? Um, but um, over the last uh, two decades, I would say, starting with Berlin, yeah, but uh, also Munich, yeah, we have more and more founders that, that have this um, mindset that also came to Berlin yeah, with this mindset to, mm. to, uh, uh, to build uh, great companies. And now we have 24 in Germany yeah, and only 18 that emerged over the last two years. So again, you see yeah, how yeah. much the whole um, unicorn hype and ecosystem has excelled yeah, over, over COVID. Yeah. yeah, and again here the biggest share is fintech. Yeah, with eight one third yeah, of them, and then uh, uh, a few others. But what you also see is that yeah, um, it's it's not only applying to the global level that we have more and more unicorns spread over yeah, spread over uh, various regions. Yeah, you have that also in Germany. Yeah, it's not only Berlin; it's also Munich. Yeah, in Frankfurt we have now one that is at least uh, uh, more or less at the billion. Um, valued, that's also the result of an ecosystem or a local ecosystem maturing over time. Yeah? I mean, when we talk about Silicon Valley, London, Tel Aviv, we are talking about yeah, um, 60 years of, of experience. Yeah? Yeah. And, and what is really special about ecosystems is that um, the ecosystem play, the interaction, the implicit knowledge yeah, that, um, that is um, you know, growing over time, this is so key. Yeah, that other unicorns can actually um, develop and emerge. Yeah, it's yeah. very seldom. Yeah. That it's they just, a point, yeah. uh, kind of, because we talked about characteristics of uh, unicorns on itself, and we, we have seen multiple dimensions now. But let's, I mean, build a bit on what you were uh, int introducing, Sebastian, on, let's say, the ecosystem. Now, how important is the ecosystem? You pointed that typically it is very important, but can we build a bit on that? And really, how can ecosystems support? Uh, these, these, these unicorns. Um, so so um, maybe Daniel, you you're from Zurich, Switzerland, which also has a number of uh, of unicorns. But uh, you you look at Europe, you look at Asia. How what do you see as characteristics of ecosystems that really foster, that are really favorable for for unicorns? Is that to me or to Sebastian? Yes, Daniel, it's, it's uh, okay, you. right. So um, so again, if you look at at the US, for example, right? I mean, it's a uh, it's a closed loop system. You have um, institutional investors that um, are putting a large part of their um, uh, overall allocation into private markets, right? Which this in turn uh, funds VCs, this in turn uh, you know, uh, um, uh, supports the, the startups. Then you have some clusters like uh, of the Silicon Valley, the most uh, unknown one, and uh, clusters like Austin, you know, Miami, you know, Tampa developing you know, very quickly. Uh, where you just have amazing resources, a lot of you know different financing options available, and this has really been you know behind the success in um, you know in the U.S. 
Um, uh, if you go to China, similar, right? I mean, Shenzhen. Um, so I don't know um, how many uh, Jane, um, how many VCs are in Shenzhen, right? I mean, I heard something like twenty thousand, right? I mean, it's 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 enormous, you know, the ecosystem. Huh? And I think um, uh, Europe, I have to say, um, has been has been catching up, you know, quite a bit. I mean, it's still by no means close to you know the levels of US uh, or China, but. I think we're also seeing um, some very, you know, interesting clusters forming. You know, you, uh, you know, London, uh, you know, Berlin, uh, you know, Portugal, for example, Barcelona, where we are actually doing uh, quite a bit of work now. And um, yes. but what's still lacking is really this, you know, top down, this, this really this cash that's trickling down from institutional investors because institutions have been very slow actually getting to private markets here. Um, but uh, what has been very positive in Europe. Uh, is really these, you know, kind of state and government associated funding systems. You know, Germany, as uh, Sebastian knows, I mean, each state, they have their own VC funds. Um, in Saxony, I think there are five, you know, alone. Um, so, you know, companies can actually get, um, you know, state-linked um, funding early on to get to a critical level, and then actually get, um, you know, get um, uh, VCs on board. Uh, and I think this has also been uh, behind, you know, the growth, the recent growth, you know, especially in the Dach region. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian, can you add anything on this? Um, well, I mean, yeah, you pointed out uh, um, the most important points. Uh, um, I, I do agree. Um, states are really um, trying to catch up, and and I see it on a, on an almost daily basis when I'm talking to government re um, representatives who want to do something. Right? I mean, the big question in Frankfurt is how can we accelerate the process? How can we build? Yeah, the ecosystem, what do we have to, to do for that? And then, of course, capital is one important um, aspect. But then, of course, it's also about talent. It's about um, accessibility to clients, yeah, where things uh, have to uh, um, uh, work together. Yeah? And that uh, that is also uh, very often a matter of mindset. Mm -hmm. So, so Jane, uh, what about uh, China, Hong Kong, or Asia, other places? How do you see, let's say, what's, what's stimulating... Uh, there, the ecosystem, or in a way that it it can benefit uh, the, the creation of uniform uh, unicorns. Um, yeah, I think um, the fundamentals to me, um, before any place I can actually, you know, become an, a, a sort of like a, a breeding ground or a nurturing ground for for unicorns, is that you do have to have some fundamentals in place. And for me, that is um, access to market, access to talent, access to funding. And I think if you don't have those main things, there's lots and lots of other areas you need additional support, especially as ecosystem evolves and matures. Um, but I think if you didn't have those those areas to begin with, um, I think it would be very hard to try and ramp it up into something that be, really becomes a, you know, a, a meaningful kind of unicorn creation um, location. Um, so... For, you know, once we've got these fundamentals in place, for us here in Hong Kong, for example, when I say access to market, Hong Kong is not that market. Hong Kong is a city of 7.5 million people. Um, you know, it's, it's a big city, it's, you know, but it's not, if you're talking about startups, it's not somewhere where you can expect just to, you know, just grow there and that's it. And, and that's why we emphasize the role of Hong Kong and through Hong Kong to what we call the Greater Bay Area, which is this area of southern China of like nine cities, which includes Guangzhou, includes Shenzhen and Hong Kong, Macau, along with five other mainland cities as well. And collectively, this area, southern China, is a market of about, um, you know, 70, 80 um, billion, sorry, a million people. So you've got a, a massive addressable market there, right there. So if you're trying to sell, of course, you know, you, you've got to make sure you've got the, the the potential markets to sell to and of course when you know once you've hit and managed to um, capture that market you extend it through the rest of mainland china and then through the rest of asia as well or you know some companies go directly to other places within asia um so you, you've got to have these kind of things in place for us in hong kong the investment side the funding side is also hugely important and as you mentioned um you know um we do need government kind of support. I mean, that is one of the roles of government, I think, to try and, and make sure that you plug in any holes that you see if there's things that you can do to try and nurture that ecosystem. So in terms of private VC money, I think in last year there was some, probably something about 3.5 billion put into Hong Kong startups. Um, when you take into account some of the other kind of, um, you know, quasi kind of government kind of in, injections and things, we're talking about closer to about 5.4 billion US dollars um, being invested in Hong Kong 
startups that's required and the hong kong does have that gamut of you know really early stage investors right from seed angel through to series a b private markets right through to public markets because the hong kong stock exchange is, is obviously you know one of the the very vibrant kind of um stock exchanges so these these have to be in place but then you know you've got the roles of academia for example hugely important in fact silicon valley you know when it started in the in the 60s and 50s you would argue it was the fact that you had these big tech companies in play and then you know you had stanford and, and these that were really trying to nurture and encourage entrepreneurship and i think you know we, we saw some of the results of that but it did take about you know 50 60 years to evolve to the stage that it has been so academia definitely has a role and in addition to the kind of ip that's and, and you know thought leadership that's been produced there it's also obviously the, the kind of startups they are nurturing and and you know these these you know, really great kind of solutions that's been de developed in, in basic research, for example, that has been commercialized. You, so you've got the academia, you've got the, the corporates have to play the role, business has to play its role. You can't um, not buy the kind of technologies or solutions, you know, that other startups are, are producing. You know, and, and if everyone does that, then, you know, you, you, the, the market then doesn't really have a chance to actually grow. Um, so you know, lots of different kind of things. And I think the difference between Asia and maybe other locations in Europe and, and in the US, is, it's more the cultural kind of thing. It's maybe more in the products and the way they actually scale and do things. Um, but I think if you look at um, a founder from Hong Kong, mainland China, and um, Frankfurt, and, you know, in San Francisco, I think ultimately a lot of the, the characteristics of the person is probably quite similar. You know, that, that kind of driven kind of mindset, that charismatic thing, able to sway and a company and, you know, a bunch of customers as well into a certain way of thinking and, you know, basically try able to sell that solution. So, you know, I, I think some differences for sure, but also some Okay. Similarities. Yeah. Let, let's uh, let's talk a bit a bit further about let's say, the regional differences. Let's say between uh, Asia, China, uh, U U.S., Europe. Um, what what is remarkable actually is that I mean most unicorns in the world are coming from either U.S. and China, which which uh, have two things in common. Uh, they they are, have they're, it's very big single markets, uh, and secondly, there's a lot of availability. Of capital. Uh, if we compare to Europe, Europe is fragmented as, as, as a market. It's not so easy. Capital is less available. Uh, on the other hand, Europe has very good supporting systems, actually, and ecosystems to support that. Um, but yeah, let's talk a bit about other differences you see between, let's say, a, a typical um, a US unicorn, a China unicorn, a European uh, unicorn. Uh, uh, Sebastian, you see in your studies also any regional differences there or do you say no they have in general there's no difference between a, a u.s unicorn or a china unicorn or a european unicorn now i think um as, as mentioned already um that the mindset thing is kind of a global phenomenon right mm. so growth yeah, at all costs yeah. but now regional differences yeah, um come into play and we see it, for example, with uh, or in the fintech space, it's much harder you know, for a new broker, for a new bank to expand into Europe. So now many, because that was part of the game, many did that. But very recent uh, um, results show that they might have um, scaled too early, yeah? um, really putting their model at risk. Yeah? So that's why you see that... Uh, um, Unicorns like N26 yeah, um, are actually withdrawing from markets. Yeah. Yes, UK. Yeah. And uh, they might have uh, fallen prone to the you know, impulse of yeah, you have to grow. This is what investors yeah, um, ask you to do. Mm -hmm. yeah? But coping and dealing with all the jurisdictional sp yeah. um, uh, specificities is, is, is uh, kind of uh, hard and, and complex. Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of experience that also from a kind. If you are a biotech company, you really have to follow all the regulations from the different countries, and they're very different sometimes, and it makes it a, a bit tough. But uh, anyway, Daniel, any any things from your side, insight about differences between European versus US versus 
uh, Asian unicorns. And actually, I'm not talking about Brazil or, or uh, Latin America. What, what about uh, those regions also, or, or Russia? Hmm. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I know the Duffy region very well, and I've also worked in the UK and you know, we covered um, Anglo-Saxon markets. So I think, as uh, Sebastian um, uh, mentioned earlier, I mean, there is still... Um, I, I feel there is still a difference in mindset, right? Uh, you know, I think a German entrepreneur on average, you know, is more modest and, you know, and less entrepreneurs really think big, you know, early on, right? If you go to countries like China, US, Israel, right? I mean, I think so some of the pitches actually, they start with financial projections, you know, even and exit, you know, uh, kind of timeline uh, before they even talk about their, you know, technology, which, you know, I think is, is, is the other extreme, right? But, you know, I think um, sometimes... Uh, you know, the, and I think also this is driven by the, you know, difficulty in raising money historically. You know, I'm, so I've been investing in the Dutch region for 15 years now, right? And there used to be um, discussions where investors wanted to raise uh, 1.257 million, right? Rather than 10. You know? And I think this mindset is changing, right? Uh, but I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's still hindering really a lot, you know, this emergence of really, you know, highly scalable companies, right? Sure. Um, but I think it's it, it's converging also with, with the other regions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in terms of uh, the support ecosystem in Europe, in terms of, you know, governmental, you know, funding programs, um, support by um, uh, research institutes, you know, close links between, you know, um, incubators, research institutes, universities, I think that's, that's extremely strong. And, you know, I think in some cases even stronger than in, uh, in Asia, for example, right? Um, uh, I don't know, uh, Jane, if you if you can uh, can agree. Um, so I think that there's a very solid basis in Europe, um, and if we can actually add, you know, some of the you know funding uh, possibilities and also mindset to Europe, I think Europe can really be the you know, most interesting region, you know, going forward. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe I can add like like yeah. like one point. Yeah, there are also a lot of differences within Europe, and in particular for the B two B. Uh, startups, right? Um, it's it's very important that you have counterparts, clients, yeah, that are also um, like uh, embracing innovation, yeah? and uh, we see that mm -hmm. this is also a key driver for a lot of ecosystems. And 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 what I see in Germany that uh, um, that there is not always yeah this kind of progressive mindset in mm -hmm. like like really um, also or in particular from the governments. Yeah, side. I, I think there are governments in Europe, but uh, particularly outside of Europe, they are much more open you know, yeah. um, to use startups as partners. Yeah? Yeah. So that is also a key factor. And, and I would say the German financial uh, industry yeah, hasn't um, leveraged the startup ecosystem as you have. Yeah? Yeah. Now, we talked about, a lot about, let's say, ecosystems, how they can, let's say, foster and stimulate the creation of unicorns. Now, I want to reverse the question a bit. So once you have a unicorn, how does it affect the ecosystem? Uh, how does it affect, for instance, employment in the, in the uh, ecosystem, uh, the creation of other unicorns? Uh, I, I know, Sebastian, you have done some research on that. Can you expand a bit from your view? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is all interrelated, right? And uh, once you have a unicorn... Yeah, you know that you have at least uh, a couple of employees who have experienced this growth journey. And very often we see uh, that these people are starting companies. Yeah? Um, examples like Spotify in, in Stockholm, but Uber in, in uh, San Francisco, many others yeah? um, that had this amazing growth journey yeah? produced also a lot of new companies. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many it was in, in Sweden. Yeah. Uh, I think with Uber, it was around 300 uh, companies that, uh, that were spun off um, over time. And, and this is, of course, a, a very important element for an mm -hmm. ecosystem because, you know, you don't learn to um, build a unicorn uh, by studying it. Yeah. You learn it by doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and this is the experience that is super helpful that is then traded and exchanged um, through meetups, through events, through, you know, like uh, investors and, and others. Yeah. This is how, how it builds. But just to put it into perspective, yeah, um, I don't know if you know Startup Genome. It's like a, um, a service provider from, uh, from the U.S., from Silicon Valley. They benchmark ecosystems across the world. And they developed a framework yeah, um, to map ecosystems um, according to their maturity. 
Yeah, and you can say that um, ecosystems that have less than thousand startups yeah, um, have a hard time to actually um, um, start accelerating and um, experiencing um, exponential growth. That happens yeah, um, after two, three, four unicorns, yeah, uh, which then you know kick off this flywheel effect, as we mm -hmm. say, yeah. Yeah, where then unicorns will attract new talent. Yeah, new talent will help uh, unicorns to grow faster. Yeah, would help to attract VCs. Yeah, and this is where a lot of our regions have a hard time to mm -hmm. get there. Yeah. Right? But once you get there, and this is what we see in more mature ecosystems, then things are yeah. uh, self-fulfilling. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, so, um, Jane, you see anything from uh, from let's say Asia perspective? How how do unicorns affect the ecosystem there? Um, I mean, I think there's been a, a lot of different kind of studies. Um, I, nothing that I've seen specifically addressing Asia compared to other locations. But I think, you know, the impact is, is similar in that, you know, the innovation and technology sector has, has driven a lot of like, um, you know, changes, socioeconomic changes to an economy. And, and that's why so many governments are you know, trying to build this ecosystem because we know if we nurture these these tech companies and these tech companies are, you know, those really big massive companies of the future when we look at, you know, Google and, you know, all these other kind of companies, um, you know, they started somewhere. Um, so the impact potentially on uh, an economy is massive. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, with a, a good kind of guidance, it generates positive social economic growth. So priorities is, is for sure. But I, I just wanted to address um, what Sebastian said, exactly what happened in Hong Kong is, is what he said. You know, when we first started, we had a very nascent startup ecosystem. I would say we're only been about probably about six, seven, eight years, if that actually, probably closer to six or seven years, we've been around as a, in the startup ecosystem. And I remember way back when, when we first started, the team at Investing Hong Kong was set up, you know, about eight years ago. And my boss and I would be saying, oh my God, you know, we had all these resistance from companies, but parents, the big thing from Asian parents didn't want their kids to go into startups, didn't want them to work in startups because it wasn't a, you know, a solid job. It wasn't as prestigious as working in, you know, the investment banks as a lawyer, those kind of things that you get in these, these you know, Asian kind of economies. And we were just saying, oh, my God, we're never going to get that kind of like movement. We're not going to people who just seem to be working so hard all the time, trying to evangelize about this. But, you know, exactly as, as we started getting three or four kind of unicorns happening and they were starting to to get a lot of media and attention that sort of inspires and it does trigger a cascading effect you know throughout uh, an economy and, and throughout our ecosystem to the extent where now it's still not totally cool um to work in a, in a startup here i know it's not like it's in the you know in, in the valley or something like that where it's like the hippest thing it's still not but we're getting there but i, I do think it's um, you do do you need time i think people forget we need time for an ecosystem to mature and you know as that average you know number of years from the startup life cycle i, I think daniel mentioned already the seven years kind of thing or, or maybe it was you sebastian we, we need time to to get these um, companies to that kind of level and that's what unicorns are good for it's good for inspiring people and it's mm -hmm. good for giving us a metric on how we compare with another ecosystem and also to try and um you know push the, the development of, of an economy into a certain direction that we want to go because we know technology and digitalization is a part of the future it's becoming a bigger and bigger mm. part of the future so you can either not adopt it and, and get left behind or you can embrace it make it relevant for your own economy with all nuances and opportunities and threats and then hopefully you can steer your economy in a positive direction with regards to the yeah. impact these technology companies can make yeah that's a uh, very interesting uh, uh, thought um as we're running into the last five minutes i would like to ask uh, each of you to maybe make a kind of final statement also about uh, uh, unicorns or the future of unicorns uh, maybe starting with, with daniel yeah, so, so my expectation is that um, I think in terms of number of unicorns, we'll see less, you know, going forward. I think there will be more focus really on, you know, quality of the underlying uh, business model. I think valuations uh, will come down, uh, you know, also surrounding the, you know, changing, you know, interest rate and, um, and uh, funding environment. 
I mean, there's still going to be a lot of cash, you know, available to put into startups, but I think funds will be become more picky. Uh, that's my expectation. And what I would love to see is um, here in Europe, there is um, actually the institutional investors. They uh, increase the allocations to, to venture capital. I think this will really you know, drive the development here. And um, and also, I, I would love to see more convergence, really, of these, you know, different, you know, global you know, tech centers, US, Europe, mm -hmm. China, really trying to work together using the, you know, resources in the in the best possible combination. And I think through this, um, yeah, where we can create some some really, you know, powerful and fast growing companies. Okay, great, uh, Sebastian. Any final conclusions from your side or insights? I mean, Daniel mentioned already a lot. Um... Let me try to, to add. Uh, um, I think there are a lot of challenges ahead of us. Yeah? So um, despite the fact that we will see perhaps less uh, crazy valuations, maybe also a little more hesitance in funding, yeah? uh, there is still a big need. So I, I think uh, the whole startup industry will continue to grow. Yeah, but I also think that we have to go back to more sustainable business models. Yeah, um, that's super relevant. And it's super important that uh, we understand yeah, um, government, but also industry, yeah, um, also citizens, that the growth companies are actually those who uh, um, have the best effect and impact on, on society. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Only 4% of the startups really yeah, um, turn into scale-ups that create jobs. Yeah. So we, sh we should uh, try to um, keep the, the barriers um, as low as possible. Okay. And Jane, any final remarks from your side? Um, just quite simple, actually. Um, I, I think there are lots of um, you know, global issues that are going on now. I mean, now more than ever, actually, there just seems to be so many different things you know, converging and, and all these friction points across total different areas. I do think, um, you know, if technology can be deployed in a way that actually mitigate these and improve things, um, you know, let's let's try and, and make it, let's have some kind of moral compass, you know, with regards to, to tech and innovation as well. I mean, I'm not detracting away from the fact that, you know, commercial success is, is hugely important. I think it is. But I just think sometimes... You know, we need to step back a little bit and not just think tech and growth at all costs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about the, you know, those AI uh, and, you know, the, the, the use of, of these social media platforms that have been uh, doing a lot of damage. You know, these, these kind of things can do, you know, a, a lot of good things. And I just think it's, um, it's better to do good than, than not. Yeah. Okay, with this, okay. I want to thank you all for this very high quality insightful uh, discussion. What I remember is that unicorns are just uh, not a hype, but there's also they're very important for the economy and also for the ecosystems that they live in. So thank you very much. I hope to see you all live uh, one day and, and uh, we can talk hours about this. So thank you again. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.